Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Brie Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You'll also find our new t-shirts in the shop, including podcast shirts and quote shirts from your favorite classic novels. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show, and YouTube, where we have special behind-the-narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic authors to write their novels— and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Please note, while we try to keep the text as close to the original as possible, some words have been changed to honor the marginalized communities who've identified the words as harmful and to stay in alignment with Bite at a Time Books brand values. Today we'll be continuing Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Chapter 9. Cloistered Cosette continued to hold her tongue in the convent. It was quite natural that Cosette should think herself Jean Valjean's daughter. Moreover, as she knew nothing, she could say nothing. And then she would not have said anything in any case. As we have just observed, nothing trains children to silence like unhappiness. Cosette had suffered so much that she feared everything, even to speak or to breathe, a single word had so often brought down an avalanche upon her. She had hardly begun to regain her confidence since she had been with Jean Valjean. She speedily became accustomed to the convent. Only she regretted Catherine. But she dared not say so. Once, however, she did say to Jean Valjean, Father, if I had known, I would have brought her away with me. Cosette had been obliged, on becoming a scholar in the convent, to don the garb of the pupils of the house. Jean Valjean succeeded in getting them to restore to him the garments which she laid aside. This was the same morning suit which he had made her put on when she had quitted the Thénardier's inn. It was not very threadbare, even now. Jean Valjean locked up these garments, plus the stockings and the shoes, with a quantity of camphor and all the aromatics in which convents abound, in a little valise which he found means of procuring. He set this valise on a chair near his bed and he always carried the key about his person. Father, Cosette asked him one day, what is there in that box which smells so good? Father Fauchelevere received other recompense for his good action. In addition to the glory which we just mentioned, and of which he knew nothing, in the first place it made him happy. Next, he had much less work since it was shared. Lastly, as he was very fond of snuff, he found the presence of Monsieur Madeleine an advantage, in that he used three times as much as he had done previously, and that in an infinitely more luxurious manner, seeing that Monsieur Madeleine paid for it. The nuns did not adopt the name of old time. They called Jean Valjean the other Fauvert. If these holy women had possessed anything of Javert's glance, they would eventually have noticed that when there was any errand to be done outside in the behalf of the garden, it was always the elder Fauchelevere, the old, the infirm, the lame man who went, and never the other. But whether it is that eyes constantly fixed on God know not how to spy, or whether they were, by preference, occupied in keeping watch on each other, they paid no heed to this. Moreover, it was well for Jean Valjean that he kept close and did not stir out. Javert watched the quarter for more than a month. This convent was for Jean Valjean like an island surrounded by gulfs. Henceforth, those four walls constituted his world. He saw enough of the sky there to enable him to preserve his serenity, and Cosette enough to remain happy. A very sweet life began for him. He inhabited the old hut at the end of the garden, in company with Vauchelever. This hovel built of old rubbish, which was still in existence in 1845, was composed, as the reader already knows, of three chambers— all of which were utterly bare and had nothing beyond the walls. The principal one had been given up, by force, for Jean Valjean had opposed it in vain to Monsieur Madeleine by Father Fauchelevere. The walls of this chamber had for ornament, 
In addition to the two nails whereupon to hang the kneecap in the basket, a royalist bank note of 93 applied to the wall over the chimney piece, and of which the following is an exact facsimile. This specimen of Indian paper money had been nailed to the wall by the preceding gardener, an old Chuan, who had died in the convent and whose place Fauchelevere had taken. Jean Valjean worked in the garden every day and made himself very useful. He had formerly been a pruner of trees, and he gladly found himself a gardener once more. It'll be remembered that he knew all sorts of secrets and receipts for agriculture. He turned these to advantage. Almost all the trees in the orchard were ungrafted and wild. He budded them and made them produce excellent fruit. Cosette had permission to pass an hour with him every day. As the sisters were melancholy and he was kind, the child made comparisons and adored him. At the anointed hour, she flew to the hut. When she entered the lowly cabin, she filled it with paradise. Jean Valjean blossomed out and felt his happiness increase with the happiness which he afforded Cosette. The joy which we inspire has this charming property, that far from growing meager, like all reflections, it returns to us more radiant than ever. At recreation hours, Jean Valjean watched her running and playing in the distance, and he distinguished her laugh from that of the rest. For Cosette laughed now. Cosette's face had even undergone a change to a certain extent. The gloom had disappeared from it. A smile is the same as sunshine. It banishes winter from the human countenance. Recreation over, when Cosette went into the house again, Jean Valjean gazed at the windows of her classroom, and at night he rose to look at the windows of her dormitory. God has his own ways, moreover. The convent contributed, like Cosette, to uphold and complete the bishop's work in Jean Valjean. It is certain that virtue adjoins pride on one side. A bridge built by the devil exists there. Jean Valjean had been, unconsciously, perhaps, tolerably near that side and that bridge when Providence cast his lot in the convent of the Petit Picpus. So long as he had compared himself only to the bishop, he had regarded himself as unworthy and had remained humble. But for some time past, he had been comparing himself to men in general, and pride was beginning to spring up. Who knows? He might have ended by returning very gradually to hatred. The convent stopped him on that downward path. This was the second place of captivity which he had seen. In his youth, in what had been for him the beginning of his life, and later on, quite recently again, he had beheld another. A frightful place. A terrible place whose severities had always appeared to him the iniquity of justice and the crime of the law. Now, after the galleys, he saw the cloister. And when he meditated how he had formed a part of the galleys, and that he now so to speak, was a spectator of the cloister. He confronted the two in his own mind with anxiety. Sometimes he crossed his arms and leaned on his hoe and slowly descended the endless spirals of reverie. He recalled his former companions. How wretched they were. They rose at dawn and toiled until night. Hardly were they permitted to sleep. They lay on camp beds where nothing was tolerated but mattresses two inches thick in rooms which were heated only in the very harshest months of the year. They were clothed in frightful red blouses. They were allowed, as a great favor, linen trousers in the hottest weather, and a woolen carter's blouse on their backs when it was very cold. They drank no wine and ate no meat except when they went on fatigue duty. They lived nameless, designated only by numbers, and converted after a manner into ciphers themselves, with downcast eyes, with lowered voices, with shorn heads beneath the cudgel and in disgrace. Then his mind reverted to the beings whom he had under his eyes. These beings also lived with shorn heads, with downcast eyes, with lowered voices, not in disgrace, but amid the scoffs of the world, not with their backs bruised with the cudgel, but with their shoulders lacerated with their discipline. Their names also had vanished from among men. They no longer existed except under austere appellations, they never ate meat, and they never drank wine. They often remained until evening without food. They were attired, not in a red blouse, but in a black shroud of woolen, which was heavy in summer and thin in winter, without the power to add or subtract anything from it, without having even, according to the season, the resource of the linen garment or the woolen cloak. And for six months in the year, they wore serge chemises, which gave them fever. 
They dwelt, not in rooms warmed only during rigorous cold, but in cells where no fire was ever lighted. They slept, not on mattresses two inches thick, but on straw. And finally, they were not even allowed their sleep. Every night, after a day of toil, they were obliged, in the weariness of their first slumber, at the moment when they were falling sound asleep and beginning to get warm, to rouse themselves, to rise, and to go and pray in an ice-cold and gloomy chapel with their knees on the stones. On certain days, each of these beings in turn had to remain for twelve successive hours in a kneeling posture, or prostrate with face upon the pavement and arms outstretched in the form of a cross. The others were men. These were women. What had those men done? They had stolen, violated, pillaged, murdered, assassinated. They were bandits, counterfeiters, poisoners, incendiaries, murderers, parasites. What had these women done? They had done nothing whatever. On the one hand, highway robbery, fraud, deceit, violence, sensuality, homicide, all sorts of sacrilege, every variety of crime. On the other, one thing only. Innocence. Perfect innocence, almost caught up in the heaven in a mysterious assumption. Attached to the earth by virtue. Already possessing something of heaven through holiness. On the one hand, confidences over crimes, which are exchanged in whispers. On the other, the confession of faults made aloud. And what crimes? And what faults? On the one hand, miasms. On the other, an ineffable perfume. On the one hand, a moral pest guarded from sight penned up under the range of cannon, and literally devouring its plague-stricken victims. On the other, the chaste flame of all souls on the same hearth. Their darkness. Here, the shadow. But a shadow filled with gleams of light and of gleams full of radiance. Two strongholds of slavery, but in the first, deliverance possible. A legal limit always in sight, and then escape. In the second, perpetuity. The sole hope at the distant extremity of the future. That faint light of liberty which men call death. In the first, men are bound only with chains. In the other, chained by faith. What flowed from the first? An immense curse? The gnashing of teeth, hatred, desperate viciousness. A cry of rage against human society. A sarcasm against heaven. What results flowed from the second? Blessings and love. And in these two places, so similar yet so unlike, these two species of beings who were so very unlike were undergoing the same work, expiation. Jean Valjean understood thoroughly the expiation of the former, not personal expiation, the expiation of oneself. But he did not understand that of these last, that of creatures without reproach and without stain, and he trembled as he asked himself the expiation of what? What expiation? A voice within his conscience replied, the most divine of human generosities, the expiation for others. Here all personal theory is withheld. We are only the narrator. We place ourselves at Jean Valjean's point of view and we translate his impressions. Before his eyes, he had the sublime summit of abnegation, the highest possible pitch of virtue, the innocence which pardons men their faults, and which expiates in their stead. Servitude submitted to, torture accepted, punishment claimed by souls which have not sinned for the sake of sparing it to souls which have fallen, the love of humanity swallowed up in the love of God, but even there preserving its distinct and mediatorial character, sweet and feeble beings possessing the misery of those who are punished and the smile of those who are recompensed. And he remembered that he had dared to murmur. Often in the middle of the night, he rose to listen to the grateful song of those innocent creatures weighed down with severities, and the blood ran cold in his veins at the thought that those who were justly chastised raised their voices heavenward, only in blasphemy, and that he, wretch that he was, had shaken his fist at God. There was one striking thing which caused him to meditate deeply, like a warning whisper from providence itself, the scaling of that wall, the passing of those barriers, the adventure accepted even at the risk of death, the painful and difficult descent. 
all those efforts even which he had made to escape from that other place of expiation, he had made in order to gain entrance into this one. Was this a symbol of its destiny? This house was a prison, likewise, and bore a melancholy resemblance to that other one, whence he had fled. And yet he had never conceived an idea of anything similar. Again, he beheld gratings, bolts, iron bars. To guard whom? Angels. These lofty walls which he had seen around tigers, he now beheld once more around lambs. This was a place of expiation and not of punishment. And yet... It was still more austere, more gloomy, and more pitiless than the other. These virgins were even more heavily burdened than the convicts. A cold, harsh wind, that wind which had chilled his youth, traversed the barred and padlocked grating of the vultures. A still harsher and more biting breeze blew in the cage of these doves. Why? When he thought on these things, all that was within him was lost in amazement before this mystery of sublimity. In these meditations, his pride vanished. He scrutinized his own heart in all manner of ways. He felt pettiness, and many a time he wept. All that had entered into his life for the last six months had led him back toward the bishop's holy injunctions. Cosette through love. The convent through humility. Sometimes at eventide in the twilight, at an hour when the garden was deserted, he could be seen on his knees in the middle of the walk which skirted the chapel, in front of the window through which he had gazed on the night of his arrival, and turned towards the spot where, as he knew, the sister was making reparation, prostrated in prayer. Thus, he prayed as he knelt before the sister. It seemed as though he dared not kneel directly before God. Everything that surrounded him... That peaceful garden, those fragrant flowers, those children who utter joyous cries, those grave and simple women, that silent cloister, slowly permeated him. And little by little, his soul became compounded of silence, like the cloister, of perfume like the flowers, of simplicity like the women, of joy like the children. And then he reflected that these had been two houses of God which had received him in succession at two critical moments in his life. The first, when all doors were closed and when human society rejected him. The second, at a moment when human society had again set out in pursuit of him, and when the galleys were again yawning. And that had it not been for the first, he should have relapsed into crime, and had it not been for the second, into torment. His whole heart melted in gratitude, and he loved more and more. Many years passed in this manner. Cosette was growing up. The end of volume two, Cosette. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today, while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Les Miserables. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com and check out the shop. You can check out the show notes or our website, biteatatimebooks.com, for the rest of the links for our show. We'd love to hear from you on social media as well.